Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how everyday people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. I'm Kavya. I'm a project manager by profession and I've lived across a few continents and I'm extremely interested in understanding the impact we have on nature. And I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in policy and political science. I also have a passion for sustainability to address concerns for the environment, as well as the social issues that we face. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk to special guests about how we can create a thrivable life for all. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. And today our guest is Marcus Neves. He's a scholar in Brazil. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in sustainable development at the University of Sussex. And he is passionate about environmental issues, policy analysis, sustainable development, and a bunch of other topics he exposed as a part of his academic work. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, Marcus. Great to have you here. So to get started, maybe I'll just put out the question as, this is a topic I know very little about, at least technically. Um, so what is the Anthropocene? You know, humans have existed for a long time, but not all of that period is considered to be, you know, the time period that we have an impact on. So if you could define what it means and then what is the time period that we think humans have an impact on? A good starter is to consider the origin of the term, which I think is our 19th century and just talking about how human beings are the centre of creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was one uh, viewpoint, and a few different philosophers have espoused that, but the idea that uh, we are the centre of creation and ultimately uh, resulted in the view of our dominion over the earth kind of thing. But I think, yeah, it has been since mostly the Industrial Revolution it has been when we've noticed the impact uh, most significantly, but it's probably quite a lot broader than that. In reality, the anthropocentric view is not only about humans and animals. It's about everything else. It's this idea that humans are the center of creation and that everything revolves around us. That's kind of the landscape from all every other idea. So whenever we conceptualize something, we conceptualize within this landscape that of this anthropocentric view. So When we think about a solution for a certain problem, we think about this solution coming from having humans at the center of everything. So it affects all of the results we deliver when we try to think about something. So that's one thing I consider very important to bear in mind is that whatever discussion we're having, any academic paper we write or journal, we have the bias of coming from an anthropocentric view of the world. And what I'm trying to do and we are trying to do here is trying to challenge this point of view and kind of a self-critic of ourselves and how we've reached this point and what we can do to have a more balanced perspective yeah absolutely and i'm hoping there is some positive impact of us at some point trying to think of us as i mean as being the center of the universe or just a perspective that uh, what we want out of the environment or the planet is what's most important uh, but the negative impacts that we have been constantly talking about one of them is about the impact we have on the environment broadly in terms of the say the temperature, the rising temperature of the world, and that we have had an unprecedented impact on it. Right? That's one of them that I constantly hear about. What are the other aspects that we might have already had an impact on? I think another, yeah, even preceding um, the, the impact like with climate change and the huge devastation put upon the earth, I think you go back even a couple of hundred or a few hundred years ago and there, there were extinction of other, other species that were hunted into extinction and that just showed another example of that i mean you've got you know birds like the dodo and there are quite a few examples but um that just shows the kind of lack of consideration and that anthropocentric view even if we go back to um 
you know, 500 years or, or earlier that it's been there for quite some time, I'd, I'd say. So we had a, we've always had an impact, a disproportionate impact upon our sort of environmental surroundings on the natural world, let's say, in different contexts, maybe, maybe connected to culture, maybe connected to other political or economic interests, but it's probably, I suppose, magnified in recent years, in the last couple of hundred years, each decade increasingly because of um, the capacity to inflict more damage uh, due to overpopulation and the technological advancement that we've currently got. Just drawing from this point that we have driven extinction wherever we went, and this is a pattern that has happened from a really long time, that as soon as humans develop to dominate the world, and being able to connect themselves in big big communities, they were able to dominate every other predator and displace them. So it had all sorts of impacts whenever they went. And this is normal in nature to happen, like to have mm-hmm. specific species that pulls away from the other species uh, in terms of dominating the ecosystem they are inserted in. And nature tends to self-regulate this phenomenon. So it has always happened, but a point has been reached where nature wasn't able to self-regulate anymore and they've crossed this boundary. And now we started to notice all the problems it has caused and ultimately climate change. And so just now, like I would say, I don't know, 100 years, we are thinking, on solutions and how serious are people thinking on solutions to this problem? I, I would probably say that I, I know in the last 20 years that we are kind of really serious about because anyway, we are structured in this society that prioritizes the elites. So people on the top hardly feel the consequences of the anthropocentric view of the world and everything that it causes. So if they're not being affected and they are in still in an advantageous point from this perspective, they will keep pushing it forward. So they will always be powerful and always keep pushing forward the agenda of anthropocentric view, capitalism and everything else. So just now that the upper class starting to feel the backlash of all the consequences. So we are witnessing a time where we are actually trying to solve the problem and people come, come up with solutions. So when did people start discussing what, what is the anthropocentric view and why is, is it a problem? So we've just perceived the problem and now the question is how to solve the problem. And so I, I think we should engage everybody on the discussion on why this is problematic and why this happened. And this is not an absolute truth of how we should see the world and perceive it around us. I think one of the important reasons is the growth of human intelligence. Like you were saying, of course, nature usually regulates these dominance of a specific kind of species versus the others. But over time, we have gone to the direction of exploiting not just other animals for maybe our uh, requirements, but also the planet itself, which is, say, our resources, minerals, to an extent that no other species would probably have done. And that is thanks to our intelligence um, and and the tools that we were able to develop. But that intelligence also gave birth to, I think, our ability to see the pattern of the impact we have on the planet. And that's probably when we started studying the Anthropocene perspective, criticism on it and the impact. So I I feel like that might be the core of the reason as to why we are where we are uh, in a good and a bad way. Uh, But in terms of structure of society that you mentioned, I believe it's it's just a perception of how we think of ourselves. Yes, we we won. We are on top of the you know food pyramid. Yes, and that's that's been for a long, long time. But we continue to believe that because we are on top of the food chain, which also means that you have the authority to exploit, and the universe exists for you. And by you, it means humans. But as we keep going, you know, uh, uh, growing our population, it keeps becoming like you said up the pyramid and up to the people who have the most amount of power. So their power or the the way they have structured the world, what they own, 
gets affected in case we change how we do things and that that i believe is probably the reason of why we are where we are i think we the problem is that the anthropocentric view goes to the point that we think we are more powerful than we actually are so when when i say that nature tends to self regulate it it is probably self regulating right now and we've extended this domination in a globalized way and climate change is a reaction to that so it's a response from nature of a species within the planet that has grown out of limits and climate change is a reaction and it's a self regulatory response of nature so if we keep going in this direction humanity as a whole will diminish and this is a nature response because nature doesn't care about which species is alive which one has gone extinct it just is a force that goes on and on keeps going so if you look on a planetary perspective of time and let's say we keep going to the, in this this direction humans would be less relevant because they would self destruct because that that's what's happening right now and if they self destruct other species will will go away as well with with humans but other species will thrive and nature will keep going and this will just just be a point in time where humans were dominant and they are not anymore as well as dinosaurs have been dominant for hundreds of years which longer that than we've been and they've gone away so that's just what happens and earth keeps going anyway so self regulation keeps it still happens and we think we oh, we exceeded the point where nature is regulating ourselves but we just feeling what what's happening around us if we look on a more strict ecosystem where for example a certain species of insects starts going out of control dominating the places they are they will cause a change in the environment and this change will make the environment not as good for them to thrive as it was before and it will regulate the populations of insects but consequences are felt for every being on this ecosystem there so this is what happens to us in a larger scale so that's interesting to keep in mind we haven't exceeded the power of nature to self regulate from each of our understanding we we are all from different backgrounds and different parts of the world there's probably different things that we have observed it could be cultural it could be the fact that you know for survival in a specific very tough environment a specific country a specific region would have really continued to think of themselves as somebody who are in a survival mode they are you know we have to overcome nature and only then will we be able to survive right that's probably one perception that i have seen in places which are in very difficult geographical conditions so you have to fight it for you to survive now that's one perspe- perspective that i see continues to exist when probably we don't need to anymore are there any others that either if you have seen um, in in your environment or maybe just broadly in in what you've studied and learned before i think if we just bring it back to where we're individually located to like i can talk from where i am in in perth western australia there are obviously different uh, areas different cultural influences that uh, and political and economic interests which which affect things the state that i'm living in uh, mining is a huge focus and you know sort of the plundering of the earth for for extracting resources is one of the major economic interests um for the country really but uh, born out of this state and um you know there are there are definite cultural perspectives that have shaped the way in which people uh, perceive things um this could be in some ways connected to the colonial past uh which no doubt would have shaped things um over time but it's also in other ways been a catalyst for perceiving things differently when uh issues with that has been highlighted and a kind of i suppose in Australia technically it's a uh, supposed to be a, a secular country a very multicultural country which it is um but there is that uh i suppose historical uh legacies uh which can influence uh cultural perspectives but again um where i live i think 
generally it's there's a perhaps a innovative uh, perspective compared to more traditional um, societies uh, of the West, let's say, where the cultural mindset to do with legitimizing the anthropocentric view may be a more have been more ingrained for longer. I think it, somewhere like Australia, or Western Australia where I live, there's probably more of a reflexive cultural perspective, uh, just probably because um, apart from uh, the indigenous um, uh, inhabitants that have been here for obviously thousands of years, uh, European colonialism or recent immigration has actually been where I live quite recent. So some of the political and social and economic perspectives are quite recently developed and not not very old and um, in that same in terms of the governing bodies of the region. But, um, you know, so the cultural lens from which that impacts on things is, is perhaps uh, reasonably pliable and changeable because of, um, yeah, being quite new. I'm not sure about, yeah, other, everyone else's uh, background perspectives. Uh, cultural perspective is fundamental. I, I think where you are, uh, Australia is a more progress focused point of view. And here where I am, which is Brazil, the innovative systems of thinking tends to come here with delay. So the discussion and challenging an anthropocentric view is much bigger there than it, than it is here. So we see embedded in the speech of like normal conversations with people, you can, you can sense that they are saying what they're saying from an anthropocentric view. It just feels like they've reached these discussions before us. And when we get there into the discussion, you are in a different stage, which is more of implementing the knowledge that's being created from the discussion. Yeah. I also wonder if um, it's interesting because um, using like Australia as an example, in, in some ways there is that innovative perspective and I, I do see that globally compared to some maybe um, other parts of the West which have a more, I don't know, almost chauvinistic Western viewpoint about exploiting and so forth. But I mean, Australia definitely does have that and has had that significantly, a lot of disregard for the ecosystems. Now, that, that's definitely been there and globally too with, with being pretty poor with climate change. But on a cultural level, yeah, maybe that's where there's the difference. There's the political and economic interests where their countries can lag behind, but then there can be the kind of individual mindsets of people. And I think that's where I perhaps, where there's possible uh, change and opportunity. I, I see that where I live anyway, where the individual perspectives are perhaps more on board with what's needed to change, but some of the economic and political interests and the will there aren't really on board. So a <laughs> bit of a difference, I think, um, between those, yeah. And for me, I mean, I grew up in India. I'm currently working in, in the Solomon Islands. I'm guessing most of you might not know too much about it, but it was a huge part of World War II where the Japanese and the US forces, uh, including Australian supportive forces, were all really at the core of it. And that did have a huge impact on one hand on the, on the nature uh, of the place, uh, but also it shows that somebody else who's, who has nothing to do with it, it's a story of climate change also, that somebody who has nothing to do with these wars is affected by it. And I see a much more cultural perspective of community, which is kind of on top of, it's the highest priority uh, for, for people here. And then comes maybe, uh, and then economical, you know, ability to pursue something. So the whole perspective of, yes, uh, we have to be environmentally friendly. Yes, we agree, but we cannot afford to, if we need to, you know, grow ourselves, the city needs to grow. We need to have roads, we need to have, good facilities to host games and all of these are a perspective that constantly being seen. And back in India, I mean, it, it's almost the highest population in the world now. And it, and something I noticed slightly later in my life is the areas where there is some, some forest and, uh, you know, trees and waterways doing really well are the places that were extremely difficult for that time to, for, for humans to have taken over. And hence, they are preserved. So the cities I live in and places I've lived in, cities were also quite, you know, uh, were forest areas. So they had rivers and lakes before. It's just that they were easier to take, take over and people did go through it. And one is that, the, the whole point that we don't yet have the ability to take over nature. 
And the second, I have noticed that culturally and uh, religious, but by religious, I mean more like nature worshipping religions and cultures somehow have found a way to preserve the world and, and understand that we live in an ecosystem and we are just one part of it. And being more connected and preserving it gives you more intrinsic value. But that's such a small population. And in most places I have seen in India, it's it's a very economically backward and not politically strong population. So as a result, the ones who want to ensure there's economic progress and and what you the easiest way to do that is to explore the resources that are around you and not necessarily pursue something that's more uh, useful. So that's has been my uh, I guess experience in 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 seeing how people perceive. Um, and I think a simple way that I would talk about it is, for example, I'm sitting in an air conditioned room right now because it is extremely hot outside. And it's a constant battle of when do I turn it off and keep it on because I don't want to be extremely uncomfortable, but also I don't want to be the one person for whom this this air condition runs and there's all these heat that it's pushing outside back into the environment. And that consciousness, I think, doesn't exist, especially at the elitist level. We we ens- we want to ensure that we are always comfortable and more than comfortable. Um, so that's what I have seen. Um, I know we have a lot to probably share in, in terms of this, um, but we might be a little out of time. Uh, so maybe we could talk about how we could have, I think, a broader perspective of the impact we have on the environment and how to influence the world uh, in this regard. I know it's a very broad question and big question, but anything that you have in mind about this would be great to know. I consider it to be just having the principles and from the principles we reach a situation. For example, it's impossible for me to not have an anthropocentric view in everything I do because I live my life where I've been raised on an anthropocentric world and everybody around me taught me that way. So it's an exercise in which I question myself. What what is the end goal? Who I'm trying to benefit from this perspective I'm offering? That's an example. So anthropocentric is just having humans as the focus point. So everything that's done is to in the benefit of humans as a species. So this is kind of, uh, this is not about reality. This is that we've just followed this pathway of having, just because we are all from the same species, this should be the priority. In other times, it had been more restricted. For, For example, European who settled here, they had Europeans as the goal to be benefited from the policy making. And they didn't care about the others, like the indigenous people who were here. They, it, it wasn't important for them. So what they did was create a ro- world around here that had Europeans f- the, from the European perspective. And now we've kind of overcome th- this this situation and we have humans at the center. So this is not good enough and we can question that, we can challenge this point of view. So just having in mind that we are always working on a framework and coming from a, a landscape of thought, we can understand that an anthropocentric view is just a view of the world, but it's not about the reality of the world. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think I think that sums it up really well. I think there's uh, we definitely see those those different influences through colonialism. Uh, there was a similar attitude, you know, from the West, from European powers, and we see that extrapolated and expanded into uh, the way in which we treat the natural world too. So I think yeah, what Marcus said just sums it up really well. Yeah, I can't think of anything else. It's just constantly questioning back and and wondering why do you think of something the specific way you do? Is it because I'm the most important person here? Or are you conscious of everything else that happens around you? I would just say that we don't have only one way of thinking. It's, these are different streams of ways of analyzing a situation. We will have the egocentric point of view 
a community centric point of view, uh, uh, anthropocentric point of view. It depends on when we are analyzing a situation. And there can be situations of where egocentric point of view is the best point of view for your, your case. But we should try to add the more perspectives as we can and understand that they are just perspectives and there's no ultimate right or wrong. And what we're trying to push forward here is a kind of a world-centric point of view or nature-centric point of view, a system where we are part of nature and there's no hierarchy of who is more important than he, who. We're trying to make decisions which are better for the entirety. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mike. I hope to talk to you both soon about maybe more topics. It's a very broad, broad area of uh, biodiversity that both of all of us are interested in. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kavya.